Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really pleased to welcome you here on behalf of the Infosys Science Foundation. Thank you for making it. We have with us Professor Arunava Sen, and I'm pleased to invite Mr. Srinath Patni, member of the board of Infosys and trustee of the Infosys Science Foundation, to introduce Professor Sen and the talk. Thank you. Uh, dear folks, it's a privilege to host Professor Arunava Sen here at Infosys uh, today. I am pleased to welcome him on behalf of Infosys and Infosys Science Foundation. As you may know, besides being a professor at the Economics and Planning Unit at Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi, he is also the winner of Infosys Prize 2012 in Social Sciences Economics. A very high profile jury headed by Dr. Kaushik Basu awarded him the prize for his game theoretic analysis of mechanism design for implementing social choice rules when individuals have diverse information and incentives. Professor Sen has discussed the potential application of mechanism design theory to an important policy questions in the Indian context namely the issue of land acquisition for special economic zones or for other industrial developments. This is just a part of this exciting discipline and I'm sure you will hear more during his talk this afternoon. Professor Sen received his bachelor's and master's degree from the Delhi University, an MPhil from Oxford University and his PhD from Princeton University in 1987. He is an economic theorist who works on game theory and social choice theory with a focus on the design of voting systems and auctions. And a very interesting topic in the present context as all of you can understand. He is a fellow of the Econometric Society in 2003 and recipient of the Mahalanobis Memorial Medal of the Indian Econometric Society in 2000. Thank you for taking this time to talk to us and share your thoughts on this very interesting complex topic of today. I'm sure that you will have a very interactive session here. All of us here as well as there are guests from outside would uh, probably ask you a lot of questions and we have people on the call also. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. So I'm uh, extremely pleased uh, and honored to be here and to be speaking today. And I uh, wanted to uh, serve as an introduction to mechanism design and, and to the huge range of issues uh, it addresses. But I'm afraid uh, what I will be speaking today, uh, you know, is kind of uh, toy stuff, if you will. But I hope it will uh, pique your interest and it will introduce you to the sort of numerous possibilities uh, in this area. So what I want to be talking about today is, uh, is voting, okay? Uh, so what's, uh, you know, think of the following problem. So uh, there is a jury and it consists of uh, three people, one, two, and three, who have to decide who to uh, award a prize to, okay? And, and there are, let's say, three candidates for the prize, uh, A, B, and C. And um, so the data for the problem, if you will, is that each jury member has an opinion uh, regarding the candidates. Uh, for instance, um, you know, one's opinion could be that A is the most deserving, followed by B, followed by C. Uh, C. Uh, two's opinion could be, uh, you know, B is the best, followed by C, followed by A, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, uh, the situation or, 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 or the data for the problem is a sort of a collection of opinions of, of each of these, um, uh, of each of these jury members. And, and um, you know, this is referred to as a profile. So, this is a profile of opinions, a profile of preferences, or whatever. And what we're really interested in are properties of voting rules, 
right? So this is, you know, this is a central object of interest. And what the voting rule does is that it takes as an input the opinions of these people, and what it outputs is a winning candidate. So, you know, mathematically, what a voting rule is, 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 is a mapping, right? It maps these profiles or these, uh, you know, the set of profiles to, to outcomes. Yeah? So, so this, is our, uh, this is our object of interest. And, and uh, you know, mechanism design, if you will, in the voting context is how to decide or how to design good voting rules. Okay, so let me try and ex uh, you know let me begin by giving you uh, examples of voting rules. Yeah? You know, just to make you aware of the possibilities here. Okay, so here is the most common voting rule, the standard voting rule. So this is perhaps what we uh, you know this is actually what we use in in our elections, and this is uh, actually called the plurality rule. So what do we do in a plurality rule? We ask, you know, what we do is we look at the best candidate uh, of each jury member, right? And we count the number of uh, jury members. So for every candidate, we look at the number of jury uh, uh, members who support it as a best candidate. And then we simply select the candidate with the best score, that is, who have the candidate who has the highest number of jury members supporting that candidate. This is called the plurality rule. And, um, you know, we, we select the guy with the, with, the, with the highest score. Now, notice that this may require some tie-breaking because of uh, it may well be the case that several candidates have the same number of people supporting it, you know, the same uh, number of jury members. So one guy has A on top, the other guy has B on top, the third guy has C on top. Who do you select? We have to, you know, we have to uh, use a tie-breaking rule, right? So, you know, whenever it comes to ties, I can't, uh, you know, resist my favorite, uh, you know, tie-breaking story. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, at University College London, uh, they actually... Um, uh, keep the embalmed body of, um, you know, of the famous philosopher Jeremy Bentham. It's on, it's, uh, I, I don't know whether this is true now, but it, it, it's, it's kind of on public display in one of their, uh, in one of their, um, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, rooms. And, um, you know, whenever, uh, by the way, Jeremy Bentham died in the 19th century. Uh, now, whenever they have... Uh, uh, meetings of the Council of the University College London, uh, whenever there is a tie, uh, Jeremy Bentham's body is actually taken to this room, or actually it's perhaps taken to the room, you know, for every council meeting, and whenever there is a tie, Bentham votes, and he always votes for the most radical proposal on the table. You know, Bentham was a, was a, was a guy with a you know, radical... Uh, uh, inclination. He was, uh, I believe, important in the abolition of slavery and so on and so forth. So, so I mean, you can have all kinds of uh, crazy tie-breaking rules. So that's just a story about that. Now, here's another. Now, here's another. Uh, here's another variant: uh, the plurality with runoff. So this is, for instance, uh, uh, popular in France. The French French presidential election uses this method. So there were uh, elections for president uh, recently, so there were four candidates. Uh, uh, you know, essentially there were four important candidates, Sarkozy, uh, Hollande, uh, then the guy on, 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 on the far left perhaps, Mélenchon, and you know, one candidate on the far right, uh, Le Pen. Uh, in the first round, people voted, uh, and you pick the two guys who get the highest number of plurality votes, uh, and they go on to the next stage, where there is another round of voting, and then you have a majority contest. You just see who has, you know, which, uh, which of the, the two guys in the second round gets the highest number of, of first votes, right? So, um, so as it happened in France, the, you know, the, uh, you know, Hollande then, uh, Sarkozy went to the second round and, and, and Hollande eventually won. 
Okay? So this is a plurality with runoff. Um, well, why should we use only information about the first ranks? Why not use the information about candidates who are ranked lower than the first? Right? Uh, the idea is that you know maybe uh, maybe there are three voters. Uh, you know, suppose there are three voters and four candidates, and um, voters one, two, and three uh, rank a, uh, you know, a, b, and c first, but they all rank d second. So, you know, D is kind of a compromised candidate, and, and there is a good case for, for picking D instead of either A, B, or C, but a plurality would clearly, uh, uh, you know, knock D out of contention right at the beginning. So, well, this is what we could do. I mean, if there are M candidates, right, the, uh, you know, a candidate gets a score of M minus 1 if it is ranked first by a voter, M minus 2 if it's ranked second, uh, and 0 if it's last. And, uh, you know, the score of a candidate is the sum of all the scores it receives. And then you, again, select the guy with the highest score with tie-breaking if required, and that's called the Borda rule after uh, a French uh, uh, philosopher of the... 18th century called Jean Charles Borda. Okay, and and uh, you know the plurality and Borda rules are both special cases of what are called scoring rules. So what's a scoring rule? You have the scoring vector s1, s2, sm. These are these are numbers with s1 larger than s2, larger than sm. They're all positive, and the first. Weight S1 is strictly greater than SM. Otherwise, uh, you know, otherwise you aren't choosing at all. And um, so S1 is a score given by a voter to her first candidate, S2 to her second, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, the, you know, then you add up the scores, and then uh, the outcome is the candidate with the highest score. And 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 you can easily see that the plurality and the Borda and so on are all. Uh, special cases. The plurality is the scoring vector 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, Borda is m minus 1, m minus 2, 0. Uh, there are others too. Uh, uh, you know, there are millions of others. Uh, you know, there's something called the anti plurality rule, which is 1 for everything except the last. Uh, you, you can choose your, uh, you know, you can choose, uh, you know, you can choose your. Um, you know your, uh, you know your own uh, voting rule. So here is um, here is another important class of voting rules, and 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 this is called um, you know these class of voting rules are called majority voting rules. Okay, and um, so here is the idea: for every pair of candidates A and B. Uh, you know, we say that A is preferred to B by a majority if more than half the voters prefer A to B, right? So we take a pair AB, we ask, look, how many guys like A to B, right? And if more people like A to B than B to A, then A defeats B by a majority, okay? Now again, there are these, uh, you know, there are these... Uh, sort of uh, irritating issues regarding ties, what if they get the same number, let's, uh, you know, wash our hands uh, of those uh, issues because they're not really central to our discussion by saying that, look, there are an odd number of voters. You know, otherwise we have some way, again, of breaking ties. No, you know, no big deal there. <clears throat> now, what's the next step? Let's just say that we pick the candidate who defeats all other candidates by a majority. Now, this sounds like an awfully attractive idea. Right? This candidate who wins, you know, has legitimacy because it defeats everybody. Right? It's, uh, you know, no, no matter what counter proposal you offer, uh, this particular candidate will defeat it. Okay? So why don't we go for it? You know, why, do, why don't we use it more often? Any ideas? You know, the idea is that it doesn't work, you know, you know, for a very important reason. And um, 
you know, this was pointed out by, uh, by another uh, uh, you know, Frenchman called uh, the Marquis de Condorcet in 1785. This guy was, uh, was uh, a French aristocrat who actually lost his, uh, he lost his head literally in the, in, in the, in the revolution, in the French Revolution. And, um, uh, you know, he sort of dabbled in, 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 in political science and he was thinking about these issues because of elections to the, uh, to the French uh, uh, Academy of Sciences. But, I mean, he's an important political philosopher. And if you go to Paris, you will actually see a statue of him uh, somewhere on the left bank. You know, he's, um, you know, he had this important example. And so here are, you know, let's go back to our, uh, you know, jury problem. There are, you know, there are three outcomes, A, B, and C. And um, suppose voter one uh, prefers A to B to C. Voter 2 prefers C to A to B. Voter 3 prefers B to C to A. And let's try and see what majority vote tells us. Now let's compare A and B. Observe that 1 and 2 prefer A to B. Therefore, majority prefers A to B. Note that now let's compare B and C. Note that 1 and 3 prefer B to C. So the majority prefers B to C. And let's think of A and C and note that 2 and 3 prefer C to A. So a majority prefers C to A. So what's the conclusion? What's our conclusion here? Our conclusion is that there does not exist a, there does not exist a candidate which beats every other candidate in a pairwise majority contest. So there is no way of selecting. We, we, you know, it's, it's all very well to say pick the one which beats every other candidate in a pairwise majority contest, but the problem is it may not exist. Right? So we have what uh, we call an existence issue. And we have this is called, you know, this particular uh, phenomenon it's called the Condorcet paradox. I don't know why it's called a paradox. Uh, it may, maybe it should be called a Condorcet phenomenon, or a, uh, it's called, but it's called the Condorcet paradox, and these preferences are called the Condorcet cycle. Right? Now you might say, well, okay, uh, you know, we have this, but let's kind of modify the rule and say, look, we will prefer, we will pick the majority winner when it exists. And... Um, uh, you know, there are many ways you can do this, right? So, so for instance, um, you know, pick the candidate that beats the largest number of other candidates in, in majority contests. Now here, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, every candidate beats exactly one other candidate in a, in a pairwise majority contest. So again, you have, in this case, the freedom to choose A, B, and C. You know, you use some tie-breaking rule. So you might require a tie-breaking rule, but if you have a tie-breaking rule, you, you, uh, if you have a tie-breaking rule, again, you have a well-defined procedure. You know, that's all I'm trying to say. So, what I'm, so, so what's the, so, so, so what's the, shall we say, the, the takeaway from this? That, look, uh, if you try finding majority winners, you'll get into trouble. But perhaps you can modify the rule and, and say that I will pick majority winners whenever they exist. Whenever they don't exist, I'm going to do something, you know, and, and, and there are many ways, and there are many, many proposals which have been made about how to deal with the situation when majority winners do not exist. So, so these are an important class of voting rules which are called majority, uh, you know, a Condorcet type rules or whatever. So what's the upshot of our discussion? You know, there's an astronomically large number of voting rules. Right? And the interesting thing is that they have been studied for centuries. In fact, uh, some, you know, some, some curious people have, um, you know, have made their proposals for voting rules. Uh, one such person is, is, is Lewis Carroll, the guy uh, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. So his real name was uh, the Reverend Charles Dodson, and he was a professor of, uh, of mathematics in Oxford in the uh, in the 19th century, and, and there is something, for instance, called the Dodson Rule, right, which is, uh, 
which is a sort of a Condorcet type rule, but he proposed this rule and and, and, and in fact, uh, computer scientists today are, uh, you know, I've seen papers, uh, uh, you know, computing, you know, various complexity properties regarding that rule. So, you know, uh, so, 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 so here is the, the uh, you know, so here is uh, the problem. Uh, you know, you have voting rules and there's, an, there's a huge number of voting rules. So, I mean, you can make a quick calculation. Um, if there are if there are three alternatives, then there are six possible orders. So there are 216 profiles. At each of these uh, profiles, uh, you can select one of three uh, alternatives. So you know the number of voting rules is uh, you know what is it? It's it's the order of uh, three to the power 216 or something like that. So I mean it's just you know, it's greater than all the atoms and molecules in the universe and stuff like that. So it's just huge. Now here is uh, where we come to this business of mechanism design. And it starts with, the, you know, one fundamental observation that voting, you know, you actually have to vote because a voter's opinion is private information. Because the person outside does not know what a you know what a jury member's opinion is or what a vo or a voter's ranking of candidates are. If this, if it was if it was commonly known, if it was known to everybody, then we wouldn't actually need the institution of voting. We wouldn't have to actually go and express our preferences. You know, it would all be stamped on our forehead. And, and, and there would just be some sort of way, you know, the election commission would just announce, look, I mean, we all know this is, this is the outcome. You, you don't have to go and express your, uh, you don't actually have to vote. So here is what's critical. The voter has to reveal their private information by the act of voting. And then the voting rule acts on the profile of announced opinions to select a candidate. And these announced opinions are not necessarily the true opinions because a voter will clearly recognize that he or she, I mean, there is no compulsion for this voter to behave truthfully or to vote truthfully. Okay? So in other words, the voter always has the opportunity to misrepresent her opinions. Now, now, here is the question. If a voter you know, has the freedom to vote, as he or she feels like, then how should she do it? How should she do it? Right? Obviously, uh, if you think about it, then the first thing that should strike you is that the way that you vote should depend on the way that you think others will vote. If you think others will vote one way, you might vote for a certain candidate. Otherwise, you might vote differently. So your, the way that you vote or your decision to vote depends on your beliefs about the voting behavior of other voters. And so if you want to phrase this in a formal way, then you would say that Voters are playing a game of incomplete information, right? So by, 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 you know, what do I mean by that? It's a situation where voters have private information. Uh, so, so uh, you know, a voter, uh, you know, knows her own private information and has beliefs, perhaps, about the information that other voters, uh, the, 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 the types or, or the opinions that other voters have, okay? So this is the setting. So this complicates, or, uh, you know, this complicates, uh, you know, the situation a great deal and is, in fact, the heart of the strategic voting problem, right? It's a strategic voting problem because you decide how to vote. So here is an example of how strategic voting might occur. And... Well, I'm, 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 I'm not making any claims uh, uh, 
uh, you know, about what actually happens. But, you know, this following might seem plausible. So suppose there are five voters or five jury members and that there are uh, three candidates, A, B, and C. So uh, voters' true opinions are given by the following table. So one prefers A to B to C, two prefers A to B to C, three prefers B to A to C, four B to A to C, and C prefers um, A to B. Now, suppose that the uh, voting rule is the Borda count. So uh, recall what the Borda count is. Uh, the first uh, choice gets two points, the second choice get, gets one, and the last gets zero. And uh, uh, then you add up these scores, and you pick the voter with the highest score. So if this is, is, uh, if this is the voting rule, then, then what's the outcome? If people voted truthfully. So this is the true situation. What do you expect the outcome to be? OK, notice that A gets how many points? Uh, 2 plus. Uh, yeah, yeah, it gets 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1, so that's 7. And you can see that that's going to be the maximum, right? Uh, the only two candidates in contention are A and B, and A does better than B. The score of A is greater than the score of B. So if, if you believe that the right way to select an outcome in this situation is by the Borda rule, then this is this should be uh, the person, the candidate that you should select. But look, you know, the sort of following behavior might, might appear plausible. Well, well you know, voters uh, one and two kind of realize that, look, the, the, you know, the race is between A and B. The race is between A and B. And uh, because they know that, well, perhaps they... You know, you know that the, the three and four they know have uh, uh, have opposite preferences regarding A and B, but they are the only you know the, the 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 large majority of people realize that look, I mean only A and B are are you know are the candidates in contention. So they you know the A guys the guys who are A on top realize that their close competitor is B. So what might you do? This is very you know this is the way you might vote. You put your best candidate on top, and the, and, and, and the guy who you think is your competitor, you put it at the last, so that that guy doesn't get any votes. You're trying to promote your own candidate. So what happens is that A is first. The, guy who have, the, the guys who have A on top, um, they vote A on top. But they put C second, the guy they don't really like, and, and, and put that guy second, B last. And the B guys do exactly the same. They put B first, and, 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 and they try and destroy A's uh, prospects as much as possible by putting A last and put C in the middle. Okay? And let's say C just votes truthfully, right? No big deal. So what happens now? The Borda count will now operate, the Borda count will now operate on the announced opinions because there's no other, there's nothing else to go by. You have to go by what's announced. And according to the announced opinions, who wins? It's C. Right? C gets uh, 2 plus 4, 6 votes. That's more than anything else that the others get. So what do you end up getting? You end up selecting this outcome which 4 out of the 5 guys think is the worst candidate. But because they because you're not, because you don't know the opinions of the other guys well, right? And you have the freedom to vote in any way you want to. You end up voting in a way which elects the guy which the majority of people think is the least deserving candidate, right? And um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh, you know, there's a. Um, you know, well-known, uh, you know, prize in contemporary art in India, uh, you know, where I'm told something like this happened uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, you know, I, I have some uh, inside information on this because, uh, you know, my, you know, my, you know my, my wife is an art historian and, and, and she was telling me this is the way that people thought 
uh, others were going to vote, and, and this is what happened. So I, I, I really can't take names because that would, be, that would get me into a lot of trouble. But, uh, I mean, it's not implausible. Okay. So what? So here's, um, so here's what we need to do. Uh, we need to design a voting rule which has the property that it will elicit information uh, truthfully. Because if people don't vote truthfully, if people vote strategically, then the outcome will be very different from the outcome that that is desirable according to the voting rule that you have selected. Right? The voting rule tells you if these are the outcomes, if, these are the, if this is the profile, this is the outcome. But the profile is based on your true preferences. Right? But now people are voting all kinds of rubbish, so the outcome is not likely to be the outcome that you would want when the voting rule operates on the true preferences. So let me give you another illustration. So suppose there are two voters. And, 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 you know, voter one is playing uh, rows and voter two is, is playing columns. So uh, what we have here is, is uh, so what does this matrix kind of tell us? Um, you know, if, uh, so, so, so suppose, uh, you know, I look at uh, the third column uh, or the third row, that's BAC. And I look at the, let's say I I I I I, I look at the, uh, you know I look at the last column CBA. So when this you know this is the voting rule. So when uh, when one vo you know when the row voters preference is BAC, opinion is BAC, and uh, the column voters one is CBA, then the outcome is B. I'm just giving an out. I'm I'm just giving an example, right? So this matrix represents a voting rule. Right, because uh, you know, given a row and a column, uh, you know, we have an outcome which is given in the matrix. Right, so this is exactly a voting rule. Now the question is, uh, is this a good voting rule? I, I mean, I, I don't mean to defend it in any way. I don't even have a description for this in terms of the voting rules that I discussed earlier. This is just some something that I wrote at the top of off the top of my head. Okay, now now. Just look at this. Now suppose row voter with opinion ABC believes that the column voter will vote BCA. Now notice I use the word believes because you don't know how the guy votes, right? Because in, 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 you know, in, in our, you know, the way that we model voting, you know, you vote independently, okay, or simultaneously or whatever. You don't know how the other guy votes, but you have beliefs about how the other guy will vote. Now suppose that the row voter with opinion ABC believes the column voter will vote BCA. Then voting truthfully will give this, uh, you know, will give the outcome B, right? You know, voting truthfully will give, uh, you know, voting truthfully here will give B, but by misrepresenting and voting ACB, she will get A. Now notice that A is better than B according to her true opinion. According to her true opinion. So what does this mean? It means that voter A has an incentive to, to manipulate, you know, to misrepresent in this voting rule. You may spot other uh, situations uh, in this voting rule where, uh, you know, where a uh, voter might wish to manipulate. Okay? So you'd say, look, this voting rule has drawbacks. Why does it have drawbacks? Because there is some situation in which some voter with some opinion and some belief about the way the other voter will vote wishes to misrepresent her, her, her preferences. And the question, the design problem is to try and see, can we design a voting rule which avoids this problem? Okay? So here is a question. Is there a voting rule where manipulation can be avoided? And so there is good news that yes, there is one. 
But this is not perhaps uh, a very good one. And this is called dictatorship. What's dictatorship? Dictatorship says, well, we pick a guy. Let's say we pick the row player or the row voter. And we say, look, whatever you want, whatever your best outcome is, your, you know, that's the outcome. You know, whatever your best uh, candidate is, that's going to be the outcome. So if, for instance, her best, uh, uh, you know, if her opinion is ABC, then A is her best. And no matter what the other guy says, you're going to give A. Her outcome will be A. Likewise, if her opinion is BCA, then irrespective of how the other guy votes, the outcome will be B. Okay? Now, here's an elementary observation that this rule avoids the difficulties that I had alluded to earlier. Right? Is there any opportunity for any player to gainfully misrepresent me? Right? Is there any belief that the row or the column voter may have to wish to cheat? And the answer is, uh, uh, you know, if you have a moment, um, if, if you think for a moment, the answer is no. Well, if you are the dictator, the guy whose choices are being respected, he's being told, look, tell me what you want. I'll give it to you. Do you want to cheat? No. I mean, it, it can only harm you. Right? What about the column player? The poor guy's opinions are being disregarded. You know, the poor guy votes. Then, you know, then the voting rule takes his vote, takes the piece of paper, tears it up, and throws it in the waste paper basket. Will this guy have any opportunity to, to, to misrepresent? And the answer is no. Because he or she knows that no matter what I do, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. Okay? So this rule has the good properties that we want it. Sadly, this is not the, sadly, this is not a rule that we would recommend, right? Right? Because somehow it doesn't, ref it doesn't aggregate opinions. What we want to do is we want to have a voting rule which seriously aggregates the diverse opinions of the voters. And this one doesn't. We ask the question. Okay, this doesn't work. But maybe hope is not lost. Maybe if we search hard enough, we'll find something which is non-dictatorial and which will work. So here is the fundamental theorem of mechanism design, if we wish. And this is called the gibbert satterthwait theorem. And this was uh, uh, proved by two guys, Alan Gibbert, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Michigan, uh, and by Mark Satterthwaite, who is a professor of economics at, 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 uh, at Northwestern. And they wrote papers in, in 1973 and 1975, respect respectively, which says that, sadly, there is no way out from this situation. And, and so this is what the statement of the result is. Suppose there are at least three candidates and at least two voters, right? I mean, if there's only one voter, then, you know, then, then, you know, then there is no aggregation issue at all. And dictatorship is great. You know? uh, but the three candidates is important. Suppose there are three candidates and at least two voters. Uh, suppose each candidate is the outcome of a voting rule at some profile. So there is some situation in which some candidate, you can conceive of a situation where every candidate will be the right candidate, right? Because uh, I, I can think of rules which uh, never select a candidate. We want to avoid that. We want to avoid that. We want to say that every candidate, there is some conceivable situation where any candidate is the right candidate. Okay? Then the result says, then the voting rule is either dictatorial or it's manipulable. In other words, there will, you know, any, any rule you give me will offer opportunities for some voter who has some beliefs about how other voters will vote, will offer opportunities for this voter to misrepresent. So there's no way that you can avoid the misrepresentation problem. And 
that's a terribly negative result. That means that you, know, you can never really achieve the outcomes you want when you have this constraint of private information. Okay? So this is the starting point, if you will, of mechanism design theory. And, and, and this is um, um, you know, all the slides I have. But, but, but let me go on for a bit and say how mechanism design theory has evolved from here. Does it mean that all is lost? You know, let's just go home and say that, look, uh, you know, there's nothing more to be said. The answer is no. The answer is no, because here is, uh, you know, here is what you can, you know, here is the good news. The good news is that, uh, you know, there may be richer possibilities than in the voting model. Now, what's the, what do I mean by richer voting, uh, you know, the richer possibilities? Is that preferences might not be unrestricted. Here, you can have A to B to C, C to B to A, etc., etc. Now, there may be natural ways to restrict the number of, uh, you know, or, or the preferences of voters, right? So, a very common um, uh, way to restrict preferences are what are called single peaked preferences. In other words, that the alternatives are arranged, for instance, in a line, and each person has a peak, a best alternative, and on either side of the peak, your preferences decline. Now, your peak could be anywhere. You know, you, there's a left, middle, and a right, let's say. And if you're a left, uh, you know, if you're a left voter, then your preferences are left, middle, right. If you're a right voter, your preferences are right, middle, left. If you're a middle Right, left. Now, if you restrict preferences like that, then in fact, Gibbert Satterthwaite theorem disappears, and you have uh, uh, you know very beautiful class of voting rules, which are called median rules, right? So you have um, you know you have median rules, which you know which uh, have all kinds of uh, wonderful properties. So what you do is that you look at the you know you you, you look at the peaks of various uh, you know, of the distribution of voters, and then you take the point which divides this peak into two, right? And that turns out to have wonderful properties. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, you, it gives voters, you know, you never have any opportunities to, to misrepresent and so on. So, so median rules uh, in, the dom in what are called single peak preferences uh, uh, work very well. Now, there is another... Um, there is another way in which you can avoid these problems, which is that you step away from the voting model. What do I mean by stepping away from the voting model? That you consider a situation where people can be compensated for with money. Right? In voting, the, the, the voting model precludes monetary compensation by assumption. Right? There's, there's no exchange of money. But in a whole host of economic problems, in fact, the preponderant class of economic problems, you can compensate people for money, right? I like A to B, and you like B to A, but I can say, look, I'll give you, uh, you know, we'll have A, but I'll pay you some money because of your, uh, you know, because you like B more than A, and, I'm, and, and you're not getting what you want. So you can compensate people by money, right? Uh, so this, the, the model with money, right, is, is, is really, uh, you know, the workhorse of, of mechanism design. And, and this is the model which people use to design auctions, right? So in the auction design problem, what you have is a situation where, let's say, a single object has to be auctioned amongst a bunch of bidders. You know, a more complicated thing is that you have many, many, you know, is that you have many, um, objects, those are called combinatorial auctions, and the point is that you have to design payments, uh, you know, you have to find a way to design, uh, you have to find a way to allocate the objects amongst people and design payments uh, for the guys receiving these objects, right, prices if you will, right, uh, and the question is, can you then design the auction in such a way that are what is called incentive compatible? So what do I mean by that? That's exactly what I've been describing to you. So those, uh, those are uh, auction rules where individuals have the incentive to reveal their valuations. 
truthfully, irrespective of the way they think that the other guys are going to bid. Okay, so your, I mean, uh, so in the auction model, your your valuations are private information, just like here, your preferences are private information. There, your valuations are private information, and the question is, can I design a way? to elicit this truthfully from you, given now that I have the opportunity of, 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 of making you pay for, for various, uh, you know, for the, for the bundles of, uh, or for the objects that you receive. And, and this has numerous applications. So, so, so um, you know, for instance, in the SEZ or the land acquisition problem, you have a single buyer, but multiple sellers. Okay, and, and the project is feasible only if uh, everybody sells, let's say, right? Or the seller receives at least K units for some K, right? So the seller has, uh, the buyer has a positive valuation only if he gets K guys to sell. And the, and the question is, can you design, uh, you know, a, a compensate, you know, can you design an auction which has the property of, let's say, efficiency. So you, you, um, uh, which means that the project takes off when it is supposed to. In other words, the valuation of the buyer is greater than the sum of the valuation of the sellers. So it is, it is efficient. Number two, that people reveal their valuations truthfully. You know how, you know, the buyer may underreport his valuation for the project. Sellers may overreport. So you want to reduce, uh, or you want to eliminate that possibility, and um, and and also that people, uh, you know, that the outcome is individually rational. That that you know that people are are are, are, are you know land isn't forcibly confiscated from them, and or they're given a compensation which is lower than their valuation, and 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 finally there are no you know injections of money from outside. So other ways to do it. So, and, and, and there are numerous uh, questions uh, which arise in this context which, which you can address. But, but this is only a sort of a glimpse of, of the possibilities. Uh, you know, you can, you, can, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're literally, um, you know, there's a whole range of such possibilities. So, so I should really uh, close uh, at this moment and... And, and try to address questions that uh, that you may have. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Th thank you so much for the for opening our minds to this uh, this this topic. Uh, uh, you know, one takeaway for me was this uh, this existence of information asymmetry, and uh, you know, people manipulate because of that. And also you have this other trend where you know, social media is, is available, people are sharing a lot of information and so on. Uh, so, so my question was, is there any, any, any sort of voting uh, game or voting situation that has been designed where uh, I as a person can, can get to know the preferences of some of my friends, not the whole, not the whole community, but some of my friends, and then base my, my voting pattern. So it's a combination, so that some information asymmetry is reduced but I only want to know what my friends think about it, and uh, or you know some people that I know think about it, and not the whole community. Is, is my is my question? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, the point is that somehow you have to model the motivation of your friends vis-a-vis -vis you, right? Uh, you know now if your friends are don't mind sharing that information truthfully with you, there are no issues, right? You should make a private call to your friend and say, look, what are you thinking? And, and let's, let's do it together. You know, let's, uh, right? So, so that might seem a reasonable model, uh, which avoids these issues uh, completely. But if your friend is actually also trying to, to mislead you, Right? Uh, then we are back to the original problem, right? Your friend is, in that sense, not your friend. Uh, but the motivation of your friends uh, is really what's critical here, right? So, so how would your friend believe, uh, how would your friend react if he knew that 
you were using her preferences for something. You know, so 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 a more fundamental question has to be asked. But but the, uh, but but let me say this is a perfectly uh, you know this you know this question is amenable to this analysis or it fits into this framework of analysis you know you can think of a model and and um, provide some answers yeah. no 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 the scoring vector 100 is not dictatorial because 100 means that i'm looking at everybody's i'm looking at uh, you know everybody's uh, best alternative, giving it a weight, and then uh, aggregating, right? So 100 zero, zero is the same vector which applies to every voter or, or jury member, right? So, so, uh, so in fact, 100 zero, zero is not a dictator. I mean, 100 zero, zero applies only to the dictator, and everybody else's opinion gets zero. So it's actually... There is another 100. It does not apply to individuals. I mean, the 100 in this case applies to alternatives and their ranks. Right? It does not. It's not applying to. It does not. It's not applying to, um, to voters. If you know what I mean, right? The 100 is not for that. So you are taking the best alternative for every voter, but you're giving it one vote. So suppose you have a system where. Suppose you have a situation where two guys have A on top, one guy has B, and one guy gets C. So A gets score two. B gets one and C gets uh, one, right? So two gets elected. We're in a dictatorship. If one is a dictator, then A gets one and everything else gets zero. He doesn't care whether other guys have A on top, B on top, C on top. So, so the plurality rule, the one zero zero, is very different from a dictatorship. So our, so our uh, general uh, election system is not a dictatorship. That is open to manipulation. That is certainly open to manipulation. That is certainly open to manipulation. That's what the gibbard saratwit theorem says, and that is certainly open to manipulation. Uh, well, I mean, uh, so, so, so formally, uh, so, uh, you know, it may be a bit of a cheat in the sense, but, 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 you know, this is formally true. Suppose there are three players, okay? Now, and suppose uh, you have the Condorcet cycle. Let, let's go back to that. Let's go back to this. Let's compute the plurality winner here. What is it? A gets one vote, C gets one vote, B gets one vote. You've got to elect somebody. Okay? Without loss of generality, suppose it's A. I, I can construct uh, an analogous argument if it's B or C. Let suppose it's A. Now look at player three. What's player three getting? She's getting her worst. Right? Now suppose she, instead of, instead of announcing voting B, Suppose she votes C. What's going to happen? C is now going to get two votes. A is going to get one. So C will be elected. And notice according to her true preferences, C is better than A. So it doesn't work. Right? So, so it doesn't work. So it's, uh, so it's a far from trivial result, the gibbard saratwit theorem. As you say, I mean, you know, you see these uh, voting systems and, and one's reaction is, hey, this has got to work. But it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, one part is designing the voting system, but is there a way to design identification of these cliques or manipulations and then find who is doing that? Because we encounter this a lot in most of this product ranking or product rating systems. So people who are a clique of people can come and then make sure that their product is the best. But can you identify them using any of this mechanism theory? No, no unfortunately, that's not a. Uh, I mean, that's a you know that's a perfectly uh, you know good question. But the focus of mechanism design is. Look, can I find one? Can I find a system where people do not manipulate? What you're saying is, what you're asking is, as I interpreted, uh, a slightly different question. You give me a voting rule, whatever it is. Suppose we have the plurality rule, and then can we figure out who are the guys? Can we figure out what the equilibrium of the system is? Who are the guys who will cheat? How will they cheat? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Right now, you can use. Uh, standard game theoretic stuff on that, right? So I, ca I can ask, well, this is the game, this is the plurality, these are the strategies, these are the outcomes. 
what's the equilibrium? Who will vote in what way? Right? They will not vote truthfully. I know that. But how will they vote? And, and, and there is a fair literature, uh, not in you know, that's not formally mechanism design, that's just equilibrium computation in, in voting games. And, and, it's, and it's actually a, a huge mess, right? I mean, you can, you know, people, because typically equilibria here involve randomization, you know, Nash equilibria uh, involve randomization and so on and so forth. I mean, so even before we start asking those questions about who is cheating and so on, people may be cheating in complex ways. They might be, you know, flipping a coin and say, if it falls head, I will report BCA. If it falls tails, I'll report ACB, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, according to, um, you know, it may be that, you know, game, you know, that we don't have the proper tools of game theory to, uh, you know, to address these questions in a completely satisfactory way. But, uh, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer theoretically, is, is, is I guess what I'm, you know, is what I'm saying. Uh, it can be posed. I mean, you know, that, there, there's no difficulty in that, but, he, but uh, it, it's not easy to answer. Yes, sir. Uh, so on and off, we have these debates around negative voting, um, ability to cast a negative vote against a candidate. Uh, how does that work? Um, what is your opinion in terms of especially the Indian uh, context? <laughs> Multi-party democracy. Okay, so, 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 so a negative vote is this expression of disgust. Uh, this expression, uh, you know, this expression that, uh, uh, you know, again, you know, I haven't thought about it and I don't know if there are any formal models uh, about this, right? But I guess one could build one, right? And so what would be the key questions there, right? I mean, if I, uh, what's going to be the outcome if I vote, my, vote the guy out of office, right? Uh, do uh, you know? Uh, can I survive without any candidates? I mean, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, so so the model has to be fleshed out. But uh, you know, as to my personal opinion, I mean, uh, uh, you know, if one were to answer it from a sort of a not a design perspective, but simply from a sort of a uh, you know, an incentive political economy kind of perspective, you would say that, well, I mean, you know, it's a, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's a, it's a complicated issue, right? I mean, uh, you know, who knows what it might do if, 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 if uh, you know, if a guy thinks he's going to be voted out of office uh, after six months, he may as well behave as badly as he can for those six months, right? Because he's going to get voted out of office. You can have an equilibrium where everybody's kicked out of office every six months. And so you maximize whatever you can get in those six months, right? Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it, it has, <laughs> so, I mean, this really gives no answers to, uh, I mean, one can build models though. I mean, there, there's certainly, uh, you know, there are fruitful lines of inquiry. Uh, you know, there does not exist uh, a fully satisfactory solution. If there was a fully satisfactory solution, then I, I suppose people would have found it. <laughs> so the question is, uh, here are the objectives which cannot be reconciled. Truth-telling, efficiency, um, you know, what's called individual rationality, that's kind of no uh, forcible eviction. And, and the fourth one is, um, uh, you know, no injections of, or transfers from the outside. So it shouldn't be something which is a money sink, you know, that you have to incentivize people to tell, uh, you know, to reveal the information truthfully. So what you have to do is to, is to design an appropriate second best question. So suppose we can't, we can't meet these four objectives. Uh, can we meet three or of those four objectives, right? And, and, and there are a whole host of, you know, they, they give different kinds of solutions, you know. Uh, you know, a salient uh, solution is always the VCG mechanism, what's called the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. You know, those are always, uh, you know, tend to be, uh, uh, you know, they're sort of a bit complicated to, to, you know, to describe at the moment. But, uh, you know, those things, uh, you know, they fail somewhere. In fact, uh, 
uh, they're not, you know, they run, uh, they run deficits or, or surpluses, as the, you know, however you want to interpret them, right? So, so the student of mine has various kinds of things, you know, uh, results which say that, uh, you know, if you use the VCG, but these deficit surplus problems tend to disappear if there are large numbers of sellers, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So, you know, I might propose something like the VCG. But, but the basic point, uh, if I were to return to the, you know, to the policy question, is that a mechanism designer would never propose something like the uh, Land Acquisition Act, which the government is trying to pass. They would never do it, which says that uh, you know, this land should be, uh, uh, can be bought at seven times the value, the market value, et cetera, et cetera. A mechanism designer would always propose an auction you know, to allow for price discovery because it, uh, you know, to allow for uh, elicitation of values and so on, right? That's, that, you know, that's how you're going to determine whether it's efficient or not. Using existing land markets, you know, prices in existing land markets is, you know, it's just a non-starter because those land markets don't exist because things are going to be, uh, you know, land use is going to be changed. So, uh, you know, that's not the way to go about it. I mean, a mechanism designer would always say, you know, design some kind of auction, right? And maybe the result of the auction is that you should not allocate, you know, it should not be transferred to industry, right? It should not be transferred to the buyer, or it should be, or something like that. But it can't ex ante set some price and say it should be seven times that, or, you know, root pi times that. I mean, that makes no sense. Oh, one more. In the Indian context, okay. In the Indian context, you are not only voting for a candidate; you are also trying to elect a party to form the government. Yeah. So, do you suggest a system that is better than the current one, which can take care of all the different opinions and still give a stable government? Uh, that's a slightly different question, but but uh, but I, I mean, you, you know, just speaking from general principles, if you will, rather than from uh, you know, a, a narrow theoretical perspective. You know, such rules, uh, you know, these globally optimal rules simply don't exist. I mean, if they existed, we would have, as I said, we would have found them. Uh, you know, the world is messier than that. So there are always trade-offs. There are always trade-offs in every situation. You know, you win some, but you lose some. So, so whether it's the right system in India, I mean, I'm, I'm not really... Uh, the right person to, um, you know, to answer that because you know, basically, you know, I do some math, you know, that's, uh, so it's, it's, um, um, again, it's, it depends on the, you know, you, you, you said, is it going to be stable, et cetera, et cetera, you know, uh, there are ways of, of making things stable, but then if, you know, those are artificial and they may not fully reflect uh, opinions, right? Uh, you know, every system, there are various systems, you know, there are, um, uh, you know, there are first-past-the-post systems, there are proportional systems, there are presidential systems, uh, and they're in use in a variety of, in, in several countries in the world, but all of them seem to have, uh, you know, all of them seem to have uh, difficulties. It, it doesn't seem that there is a, a sort of a uh, a magic uh, solution somewhere. But, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about whether there is a system better than the, than the one we have. 